Father, we want to thank you for our worship experience thus far. We simply ask, Lord, that uh, you would continue to bless as we go through this preaching moment. Speak, Lord, because your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, the simple title for this message is um, The Missional Disciple. The Missional Disciple. Uh, repentance ethics could be a subtitle, repentance ethic. Um, for the Methodist Church, uh, the writings of John and Charles Wesley have impacted what they believe. Uh, let me let me start over, excuse me. In various traditions of Christianity, there are writings from men and women of faith that have greatly impacted um, what Christians believe. For the Methodist Church, the writings of John and Charles Wesley has greatly impacted what they believe. For the Catholic Church, the writings of Thomas Aquinas uh, have impacted what they believe. For the Presbyterian Church, the writings of John Calvin, uh, those writings have greatly influenced what they believe. For the Lutheran Church, the writings of Martin Luther, uh, they undergird what they believe. For the Salvation Army, the writings of William Booth set the tone for what they believe. And for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the writings of Ellen White guide and direct what we believe. Uh, this, uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what Ellen White has written has a lot of influence on most of us as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we don't believe what she wrote to be equal uh, to the Bible nor above the Bible, but what, what we believe is that her writings have been uh, given as an aid to understanding the Bible. And we believe that her writings are a prophetic voice in these contemporary times. Uh, in her writings, in, in the writings of Ellen White, she has stressed the importance of reading various passages of scripture on a daily basis. Many of you know that she wrote that we should spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the final scenes of Jesus' life. Many of you know that she wrote that we should read 1 Corinthians 13 every day. But what many of you may not know is what she said about Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Many of you may not know. Here's, here's what she wrote. She wrote this. She says about Isaiah 58, the whole of, of the 58th chapter of Isaiah is to be regarded as a message for this time to be given over and over again. The, mess, the message, everything in Isaiah 58, the whole chapter, she says, is to be regarded as a message for this time to be given over and over again. Isaiah 58, interesting. Now, so, so, so here's the question. What is it about this chapter that would cause Ellen White to suggest that the message found in this chapter, Isaiah 58, is a message that has to be sounded again and again? And again, what is it? What is it? What what is what does it say? What what's written in it? What what message is contained in Isaiah 58 that's so critically important that Ellen White would suggest that we repeatedly share the message found there? The message in Isaiah 58 uh, that I believe we must repeatedly share is that uh, if our light is to shine the light the light in us the light of the believer if it's to shine brightly in the world and if we expect healing from god and righteousness to come from god and protection from god and our prayers to be answered by god if we expect guidance from god and and and, and sustenance from god and if we expect god to cause us to delight in him and cause us to ride on the high places of the earth um if if we expect to share in jacob's inheritance then we we, we got we to gotta live right in this world by living out the message that's found in Isaiah 58. That's, that's what I believe. It's a message to be given over and over again. In that message, there's some blessings, some promises. And if we're to experience those promises, if we're to, to receive those blessings, then we have to live out Isaiah 58 in our lives over and over again. It's not just an audible message that must be given. It's a message that must be lived. So, so in his book, in his book, Christian Mission to the Modern World, the great theologian John Stott, he suggests that once a person accepts Jesus Christ, they can't stay the same. 
right? He says this, he says, he says that the kingdom of God demands a new mentality, a reorientation of all their values, repentance. Amen. Amen. We believe that the kingdom, when we are, when we come into Jesus Christ, we don't stay the same, but we have to have something new, a new way of thinking, a new men mentality. We have to reorientate all of our values. He calls it repentance. Then, then he suggests that repentance is more than sorrow for sin. Repentance is more than just turning away from sin. So, so he says it necessitates, repentance necessitates a complete change in behavior. I know y'all say amen to that. Come on, somebody say amen. Repentance necessitates a complete change in behavior. Stott suggests that there, there's a social dimension, though, to repentance. Are y'all listening to me? Please hear me. Don't miss this, okay? He says that there's a social dimension to repentance. And, and he says, and he says, that it's impossible, please, somebody, somebody need to, re, somebody retype this in the chat so folk can get it. He says, it's impossible to be truly converted to God without being thereby converted to our neighbor. You can't can be converted to God if you're not converted to people. Then he says, this conversion to our neighbor, he, he calls it repentance ethics. Repentance ethics. You can't, I'm, I'm sold out to God, but you're unkind to people. I'm sold out to God, but you don't help nobody. You can't be converted to God without truly, you can't be truly converted to God without being converted to your neighbor. He calls it repentance ethics. Repentance ethics. Um, repentance ethics, according to Stott, is a complete reorientation of, 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 of life in the world in response to the work of God in Jesus Christ. Okay, I, I mean, I, I, it exploded in my mind. I don't know about your mind. Repentance ethic, are y'all listening to me? Is a complete reorientation of life uh, in the world, right? Everything we do is re reoriented in the world in response to the work of God in Jesus. Thus, social responsibility becomes an aspect of of, of not, uh, uh, it, does, it becomes an aspect, not of Christian mission only, but also of Christian conversion. So he says, it's not just, it's just not responsible uh, to care about people socially. It's a part of who we are. It becomes a part of Christian conversion. When you're converted to God, you're converted to your neighbor. So therefore you become socially responsible for your neighbor. The believers in Isaiah 58, they didn't practice proper repentance ethics. Are y'all listening to me? There, there was only a pretense for those folk. They didn't, they didn't have a repent. They weren't converted to their neighbor. They claimed to be in relationship to God, but they were not converted to their neighbor. Um, they had no concern for their neighbor. Are y'all listening to me? Here, here's, the, here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the heart of what I'm saying to you. Listen to what I'm about to say. Every disciple, every believer, every member of the light bearer's mission must understand that your religious expression, your worship must positively impact um, your relationship with God and others. In other words, in other words, when, when, when us living out our, our religion in this world should make this world better. Mm. Did y'all get me? If we're living out our religion, then the world should get better around us. If it does not, uh, then our religion is worthless. If, if, if the world around us doesn't get better, it's, it's unacceptable to God. John the Baptist understood this. John the Baptist understood and taught repentance ethic. Yes, he did. Watch this. Luke chapter 3. In that chapter, John, John's recorded as teaching um, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. That's what he told him. Get baptized for the remission of your sins. He tells the people after he tells them to get baptized for the remission of sin, he says, you got to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And he says, a tree that doesn't bear fruit, it's cut down and burned. This is, this is John the Baptist. Listen to what I'm saying. John the Baptist is, is an end time preacher. He's telling these folks the end is near. Get baptized for the remission of your sins. And once you're baptized, bear fruit that's worthy of repentance. And he says, trees that don't bear fruit and people that don't bear fruit, both are cut down and burned. 
in response to John's call, in, in, in response to, he said, he says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. In response to that call to bear fruit, the people ask a question. Uh, verse 10, they say, what shall we do then? What, 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 John, what are we supposed to do? How does it look? How does bearing fruit to repentance look? Look, notice what John says. He, he taught repentance ethics. Hear what he says. Here's what he says. He says, um, Luke chapter three, verse 11. He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who, he who has food, let him do likewise. Hold on, he came to preach it. In, in his time, Jesus was coming soon. Are you with me? He's the forerunner. He's introducing the coming of Christ, the advent of Christ. Are y'all with me? He, Christ is about the law. John the Baptist is preaching a message of Jesus coming. Are y'all with me? He's telling folk, get it right, because the, the Lord is showing up. And in that, in that message, he said, they say, okay, what do we do? He says, feed people, clothe people. What? Then, then the text goes on in verse 12. The, the tax collectors say, um, they got they, they came to be baptized, right? They say to him, teacher, what shall we do? Right? And John says, he says to them, don't collect any more taxes then what's what was appointed for you to collect don't cheat people stop stop cheating mm. stop being dishonest this is this is repent it's an end time it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a message introducing the advent of Jesus the coming of Jesus about to start his ministry John ain't telling folk he's not telling folk to adjust their lifestyle so they can be more holy John is saying help folk what do do your honest part so the soldiers, the soldiers, the soldiers come and they ask him saying, what shall we do? And John says to them, don't intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. Be content with your wages. John the Baptist, what I'm saying, he understood that there's a social component to repentance and he taught it as repentance ethic. Are y'all with me? There's a social component to repentance. Are y'all with me? People in Isaiah 58, they didn't get it. They didn't understand that there was a, a, a social component. Here, here, here's what it says in Isaiah 58, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58, verse number 1. I'm going to read from the God's Word translation. In Isaiah 58, verse 1. Um, the Lord, he's angry with Israel. Um, he's, he, they, they have a lack of concern for their neighbor. Uh, he's speaking in prophetic voice. Um, to get the prophet to tell, um, he, he, want, he, want, he wants, he's speaking in prophetic voice through the prophet, excuse me, uh, to tell the people a specific message. He tells, he tells the prophet, scream and don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and, and declare to my people their rebellion and show them their sin. Show them, how, show them how they missed them up. Scream, cry loud, don't hold back, don't spare. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to people their sin. Isaiah 58, verse 1, God says, the people who are trying to worship me have sins. Isaiah, as a prophet, I need you to scream loud and expose them, show them their sins. Now, now, now because, of, because of the way uh, that we as believers, as Adventists, uh, as Christians in general, most Christians, uh, because Adventists in particular, because of because of the way we disciple, because of the way we preach and and and, and teach converts how to live as Christians, it, it would seem it would seem in my mind that the people were committing adultery, um, they were murdering, um, or one of one of the other abominable sins may be found in Proverbs chapter six. And that, that, that God is telling Isaiah, it would seem this, this is what God would be telling Isaiah to address. Maybe, maybe God wanted Isaiah to yell at his people because the nation had turned to worshiping uh, the heathen gods, Ashtoreth or Baal, uh, the God of Syria, the God of Sidon, the God of Moab, or, or maybe, maybe they were worshiping the God of, of Ammon or the God, uh, the gods of the Philistines. Uh, those weren't the sins that God, that caused God to tell Isaiah to yell at the people and to, to declare their rebellion and sin. Those, those were, their, their problem was hypocrisy and pretense. They, they had correct religious form and correct, correct religious 
ritual practices, but they didn't treat their neighbor right. So, so, so starting at verse two, God tells the prophet about the nation's hypocrisy. Again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the God's word translation. This, this is what it says. I want it to be clear. I want you to, I want you to hear it. Listen, it says, they look for me every day and want to know my ways. They act as if they were a nation that has done, uh, that, that, that has done what is right. And, and as if they haven't disregarded God's judgment on them. They act, they ask me for just decrees. They want, um, they want God to be near them. They ask, uh, his, they say, they say, why have we fasted if you're not aware of it? This is what they say to God. They're asking these questions. Why have we inflicted pain on ourselves if you don't pay attention? Then God responds. God responds, verse four. Don't you see that on the day of your fast, you do what you want to do? Um, you mistreat your workers. Don't you see when you fast, you quarrel and fight and beat your workers? What? Uh, they, the way you fast today keeps you from being heard in heaven. Watch yourself. They're, they're acting religious, but mistreating people. God says, I can't hear your prayers. Oh, there's somebody on here who mistreats their wife. Listen to what I'm saying. I know I'm telling the truth. Somebody in here talks harshly to their children. Somebody here is a boss or an owner at a business or on a job, and you mistreat your employees. God says, when you fast, when you have a posture of worship, when you are so holy and, and you mistreat people, your prayers aren't being heard in heaven. First of all, is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Huh? This is God says, did, did I tell you to fast that way? To, to, to be religious and mistreat people? He says, he says, should should people humble themselves for only only for a day? Is it just is it just a day? Only when you're holy, when you're right? Is fasting just bowing your head like a cattail and making your bed from sackcloth and ashes? Is it just ritualistic? Is this what you call fasting? Now, 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 before we go to the next verse, I, I understand what we've been taught fasting is. We've been taught fasting is abstaining from food so you can hear from God or, or get the favor of God. But I want you to notice what scripture, God through the prophet Isaiah, what he describes as a true fast. He says, he says, is, is this what you call fasting? Is this an acceptable day of the Lord? So, 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 so the believers in the passage, they, they had the right religious practices, but their lives didn't change. Uh, they, they would fast as an expression of self-denial and, and, and homage to God. But while they were fasting, they were mistreating their workers and their servants. They would ignore the needs of the poor. They would take off time, uh, take time off uh, to practice their religion, but they wouldn't even allow their own workers time off to practice their religion. Their servants time off to practice their religion. They were fasting, assuming a posture of humility, hoping uh, that God would intervene in their lives and resolve their problems. Specifically, listen, in the context of Isaiah 58, um, it goes from Isaiah 58 all the way to Isaiah 59. Are y'all listening to me? In the context of this chapter, right? The, it suggests that these folk were fasting uh, because they had a burden, and 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 they were and 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 um, they their their burden was that they expected justice and deliverance from their oppressors. They wanted God to deliver them from oppression and they wanted God to get them justice, but they weren't delivering. They weren't, they were oppressing people and they weren't extending justice to others. So God is silent. Why are we fasting and you don't hear us? Why are we afflicting ourselves and you don't respond? Right? So, so what they thought is they could earn God's favor um, um, through rituals, but through ritual fasting in particular, right? But, 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 but a literal ritual fasting does not establish justice and righteousness in a community. You can act holy and, 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 and act religious, but that doesn't mean that you're righteous and just, right? Their problem was hypocrisy in worship. Their religious expression did not match how they treated people. Um, they didn't understand how they had to live their life. They didn't understand um, that 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 if they if 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 they didn't understand that if they wanted to participate in a just right and and righteous kingdom they had to be just and righteous themselves 
Hmm. So, so, so in the rest of the chapter, God introduces the nation of Israel to the concept concept of repentance ethic. And, 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 and he tells them the several blessings that will come when they have a posture of repentance that, that, that um, converts them to God and to their neighbor. So now, now, um, what, what, what I said earlier, this, what I'm about to share with you is true fasting that I'm about to share. This, this, is, in a con this is in a context of fasting, not necessarily abstaining from food. Don't watch it, watch it, watch it. God says in Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse six, this is the kind of fasting I have chosen. Notice he doesn't say anything about food, though. This is the kind of fasting that I've chosen. Loosen the chains of the wick of wickedness. Untie the straps of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Share your food with the hungry. Huh? Take the poor and the homeless into your house and into your house and, and cover them with clothes when you see them naked. And then watch this. Do not refuse to help your relatives. What? This, this is the kind of this is the kind of fasting that God says he's chosen. He says, he says, he says, he says, loose the chains of the wick of wickedness, untie the straps. The people who are bound, let them loose. Let, let, let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. Share your food with the hungry. Take in the poor and the homeless. Give them clothes if they're naked. And don't refuse to help your relatives. Isaiah chapter 58 calls that fasting. John the Baptist calls it bearing fruit of repentance. John Stott calls it all repentance ethic. So, 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 so here's the promise. When you fast that way, then your light will break through like the, um, then your light will break through like the dawn and you, and you will heal quickly. Oh, if you're sick and you're not treating people right, then you probably aren't going to get healed. But if you start treating people right, the promise in scripture, this is not Troy Brand, this is the promise in scripture. If you treat People, right. You're converted to God and converted to your neighbor. It says you'll heal quickly. Your righteousness will go ahead of you and the glory of the Lord will guard you from behind. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry help and he will say, here I am. Somebody should shout hallelujah. Get, get rid of that yoke. Don't point your finger and say wicked things. If you give some of your own food to feed those who are hungry and to satisfy the needs of those who are humble, then your light will rise in the dark and your darkness will become as bright as the noonday sun. Uh, the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy you uh, even in sun-baked places. He will strengthen you. He will strengthen your bones. You will become like a watered garden and a like an and like a spring whose water does not stop flowing. Somebody should get excited. These are the promises of God when you fast the way God fasts. When you when you assume a posture uh, when you're converted to God and your neighbor. When you have repentance ethic. God God says your your people will re will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the foundations of past generations you will be called the rebuilders of broken walls and restorers of streets where people live and i i i i i, I got to say this i'm inserting this is not in my notes but i'm going to say this anyway when i was in seminary one of my seminary professors Shared this verse, verse number 12. We love this verse. Verse number 13 comes after when it talks about the Sabbath. All right. So, so watch this. Those of you who are who are scholarly, who have a, who have software enough, or if you know how to read Hebrew, when you look at um the word Sabbath in verse 13, in Hebrew, Hebrew has no vowels in the original Hebrew, they only have consonants. So the word for Sabbath is S B T. Are you with me? If we if we were to transliterate it into English, it would be S B T, okay? Uh, and the T T makes a T H sound in our language, but in theirs is just T. All right. Watch this. The phrase um, where it says "rebuilders of broken walls and restorers of uh, of streets where people live," King James, New King James, um, um, restores um, 
uh, 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 paths to dwell in, paths to dwell in. Well, where it says um, paths to dwell in, right? The word paths is one word, but that to dwell in is another word. To dwell in is one word in Hebrew. And guess what? The Hebrew consonants are S, B, T. Why is that significant? That's significant because in Hebrew, they use what they call vowel pointings. They, they're, those are little lines in, in, in uh, New Testament. Jesus says not one yod or tittle will be taken away. He's speaking of vowel, uh, uh, he, uh, um, vowel pointings in the Hebrew uh, language, right? So they put a little line, a little dot, two dots, uh, three dots in a triangular form or whatever. They have all these little symbols that represents our, our vowels in English, right? Well, in the original Hebrew, there were no vowels. So when it says restores of paths to dwell in or streets where people live or streets to dwell in, it could very well have been interpreted paths to the Sabbath. Oh, you missed that. That's a whole nother sermon, a whole nother presentation. Listen to what I'm saying. This text could very well be saying, if you fast the way God says fast, which is being converted to your neighbor, amen, converted to God, then therefore to your neighbor, repentance ethic. When you live the way God declares to live and you worship the way God declares to worship, fast the way God says fast, you will, you will be rebuilders of what has been torn down and be restorers of paths to the Sabbath. Then it says, therefore call the Sabbath a delight. Take your foot off the Sabbath. Are you with me? Oh man, hold on to that. I'm gonna come back to that. So, so that, I mean, I'm not coming back to that. I, I'll, I'll maybe I'll talk about it this afternoon. But here's the point. Here's the point. God says, when you fast away, you're supposed to blessings follow. So, so he's what he's saying. He's saying, help those in need. Share uh, your abundance with those who have lack. Don't just pray for God to address the needs of those who are less fortunate. Be the answer to the prayer that you're praying. Don't just hope that some something good will happen for those people. Be the something good that happens for people. Are y'all with me? Are y'all with me? Now, now, now. What, what, what I'm simply saying is we cannot continue to be held back by selfishness. Notice this quote. Notice this quote. This is this is testimonies, um, volume two, page. 35. Watch this. The reason why God's people are not more spiritually minded and don't have more faith, I have been shown, is because they are narrowed up with selfishness. The, the prophet, talking about Isaiah, the prophet is addressing Sabbath keepers, not sinners, not unbelievers, but those who make great pretension of godliness. It is not the abundance of your meetings that God accepts. It is not the numerous prayers, but the right doing, doing right, doing the right thing at the right time. Um, it is it is to be less selfish and more caring. Um, uh, and more caring, it is to be less, less self-caring, excuse me, and more benevolent. Then, then she says, our souls must expand. Then God will make them like the watered garden gardens whose waters fail not. Huh, huh. Watch this, watch this. Page 29, page 29, welfare ministry. Page 29, welfare ministry. I have been instructed to refer our people to the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Please get this quote. Read this chapter carefully and understand the kind of ministry that will bring life into the churches. <clears throat> I wish I could see your faces. I wish I could see. Uh, listen to what this is the servant of the Lord. She says, if you want your church to be alive. Read Isaiah 58. And, and, and understand, no, and, and this understand is not just having head knowledge, but put it to practice. Understand the type of ministries that will bring life into the churches. If churches are lifeless, it's because they're not practicing the ministries in Isaiah 58. This is the servant of the Lord. This is not Troy Bread. I didn't make this up. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't cut and paste this. This, this, this is Ellen White. Welfare ministry, page 29. You want life in your church? Read Isaiah 58. Notice what she says. The work of the gospel is to be carried by means of our liberality as well as our labors. When, we, when you meet suffering souls who need help, give it to them. When you find those who are hungry, feed them. 
Hmm. Huh. In doing this, you will be working in lines of Christ's ministry. The master's work was a benevolent work. Let our people everywhere be encouraged to have part in it. If you have been taught by anybody that social justice is not biblical, I rebuke that teacher in the name of Jesus, and I beg you to turn from that wicked teaching. Are you with me? The servant of the Lord says, if you do social justice ministry, are y'all listening to me? You will be working in the lines of Christ's ministry. Repentance ethic demands it. You cannot be converted to God without being converted to your neighbor. Notice this. Notice, notice this, notice this. Um, uh, anyway, anyway, you should know that repentance ethic is in harmony. Are y'all listening to me? With us being an end time prophetic movement. Um, uh, it's in harmony with us declaring a last warning message through the three angels. Are y'all listening to me? Please hear me. I'm not, I'm not introducing something new. I'm not putting the three angels on the shelf. It's in harmony with the, with the declaration of the first angel, second angel, and third angel's messages of Revelation 14. I teach Bible prophecy at Southern Adventist University. I know it's in harmony. So, so, so watch this. So, so, so making, making a tangible, relevant difference in people's lives is part and parcel of the last morning message. Here's what she says in Welfare Ministry, uh, page 33. The third angel's message is not to be given a second place to this work, the social justice ministry, the repentance ethic, Isaiah 58. Uh, the, the three angels' message is not to take second place to this. This is to be to the message what the hand is to the body. Woo! You want people to hear, you want people to hear the first ain't fear God. Give glory to him and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The judgment hour has come. Come out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen. Uh, um, don't worship the beast or his image. If you receive the, be the mark of the beast, um, you'll be tormented day and night. Right? Ain't that what it says? Yes. That's the three angels, right? This word doesn't take second place to this. It's, it's, it's to be the, to the message was the hand is to the body. Okay, so so I gave you I gave you Bible, I gave you spirit of prophecy. Then I'm gonna give you some research, right? Now watch this, watch this research. The Bible says Isaiah 58. It, it says it says um, do these things, fast the way I've told you to fast. Uh, John the Baptist says John the Baptist says once you repent, feed people, clothe people, don't cheat people, uh, be content with your wages. Are you with me? That's Bible. Then Ellen White says. We got to we got to do the ministry in Isaiah 58 and life will come into our churches. We're, we're, we're working in the lines of Christ ministry where we practice what we see in Isaiah 58. Right. Right. And then 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 we won't be dry and deplete. We'll be well watered gardens. That's what she says. Right. So now good research. Our church manual. It, it Repentance ethic is in a church manual. Um, it's, it's one of our in, in a church manual. It appears as one of 14 Seventh-day Adventist standards of Christian living. It, it's, under, it's under the subheading community relationships. Watch, watch. It, it's not called repentance ethics, but it's there. All right, here's what it reads. Here's, here's a part of it. While our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we also wait for our savior, we are yet in the world as an integral part of human society. We must share with our fellows, our fellows certain responsibilities in the common problems of life, right? In every community where they live, Seventh-day Adventists as children of God should be recognized as outstanding citizens in their Christian integrity and in working for the common good of all. What? Every, we should be recognized as outstanding citizens that want the what we want common good for everybody. We want common good for everybody. Are y'all listening to me? We don't want we don't want racism to exist in this world. We don't want folk dying from coronavirus in this world. We don't want um we don't want people getting beat by the police in this world. Are y'all listening to me? We don't want payday loan places all up and down in the hood and run down houses in the hood and meth running through our rural community, meth, 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 um, the, 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 they, they smoke running through our rural communities. We want, we want what's good for everybody, the politicians and getting rich and, and the poor state. We don't want that. We want, this is what the church manual says, right? 
his while 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 our highest responsibility is to the church and its commission to preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the world we should support we should support by our service and our means as far as possible and consistent all proper efforts for social order and betterment it's in the church manual hmm it's in the church manual monty Celine. Um, Monty Selene, um, he's a, he's a, he's a research analyst with the seven that we have, we have this place called the, the Center for Creative Ministries. He's a research analyst for the Center for Creative Ministries. Here's what he wrote about the concept of repentance ethics in a paper that's on their website titled Social Implications of the Gospel. Uh, Um, he, he outlines the social implications of the gospel, um, Seventh-day Adventist church history in regards to our social action, what we've done in the past. He outlines the um, Seventh-day Adventist church's standard on community involvement and social justice, and he examines the relationship between spiritual development and social change. He, he puts it in this paper called Social Implications of the Gospel. You can get it on their website, the Center for Creative Ministry. Center for Creative Ministry. Are you with me? Um, okay, so so here's what he says. Here's what he says. The Seventh-day Adventist Church sees as part of its mission the extending of the ministry of Christ among the world's suffering. His, meaning Jesus's, was a ministry of comfort, of empowerment, of liberation, and reconciliation. Alongside other Christians, we intend to be a healing and stabilizing force in times of change. When all is turbulent about us, when the world's in confusion, the church provides assurance that there is one, Jesus, who sits above the turmoil of this world, whose purposes are eternal and will ultimately prevail. The church becomes that example that Jesus has some solutions. The church serves as a watchman in society and as an empowering community. The church has power, urging individuals and families to elevate conditions around them urging individuals and families to elevate conditions around them, upholding that which is good and transforming that which is detrimental. I don't know if you get all of that or what I'm saying. Basically saying the church practices repentance ethic. Uh, we were not just converted to God. We're converted to our neighbor and we make their situation better, their physical, tangible situation. Are you with me? He goes on to say, the pre this, is, this, is, this is my favorite part of the quote. Listen to this. The presence of active, spiritually renewed Christians in the community can do a work that political and social ideologies cannot accomplish. Believers who have experienced the transforming power of Christ can be a stabilizing, strengthening force in society and preserve, excuse me, and preserve life-affirming values. They can, they can, they can be agents of change in the face of moral decay. Their active presence in the community provides hope as individuals and families are ennobled by Christian principles and their lives and relationships impact others around them. Ah, I, be I believe that with all my heart. I believe it so much. Let me tell you something, man. Uh, let me tell you, I, I, I am encouraged by the fact that that, that, that this church that I serve, the Orchard Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, the congregation that God has blessed me to have stewardship over, has become a church that engages in ministries that address the whole person, that reflect Isaiah 58, ministries that deal with physical, emotional, and the spiritual person. Are y'all with me? Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not unique in this. I'm not special in this. I'm just following Bible and spirit of prophecy. Are y'all listening to me? I, I, I believe that the church that God has put me in charge of, that we practice repentance ethic. So, so, so let me give you an example. So currently we have our getting ahead um, and the just getting by world anti-poverty program. Uh, I could tell you about that in the afternoon or when we meet a few Sundays from now. We also host the community, a whole bunch of folk from the community coming to our church, nonprofits, about 35 or 40 people every time, once a month. It's about 75 people in the network. They meet at Orchard Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? Um, um, uh, what else do we do? Um, we, we, we lead out in trying to address police use of force issues in the community. Yes, we do here at this church. Um, 
We're not doing everything we can do, but we and we can do more. We do. Let me show you. Let me show you. Um, because we're hoping to to make an impact on the city. What we and I'll share with this with you later too. We we desire to be embedded in the community in such a way that nothing happens without us having influence over it. Right. This is the this is the community advisory board. Listen, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist preacher, but you know what I do? I participate on the uh, in the pastor um, the pastoral fellowships. Yeah. Um, white guy standing up there with the beard, hand in his pockets, the gray beard, he's Anglican. Uh, they're Baptist in that thing. There's some non-denominational, I don't care because Ellen White tells me in the spirit of prophecy that as a minister, it's my responsibility to convert other ministers. I can't convert them if I don't have a relationship with them. So I meet with them, I sure do. And we do ministry together. There's another picture of us. Um, this is a racial reconciliation group, all the ministers, right? This is a um, Southern Adventist University, just like you guys are going to the laundromat later today or whatever day it is, we go out to the laundromat, the gas station, um, we do drive through prayer. We do a whole bunch of community engagements every second Sabbath, Compassion Sabbath. Um, this is some folk inviting people out to our community block party. Um, this is a truth and reconciliation ceremony between uh, white pastors and black pastors in the community um, right in our city. Um, this, is, this is a group of people who participated in our Healthy Church Challenge. We had um, 17 churches, not Adventists only, as a matter of fact, we were the only Adventist church. We let out in it. We taught our health message to 16 other churches in what we call the Healthy Church Challenge. You talk about influence. We're trying to convert them, folks. Come on, somebody say amen. This is a, a, a Thanksgiving feeding we did for the community. Um, the guy, uh, the black guy in the front on the, on the left, little short dude, that's my son-in-law. He, he, he gets it. You know what he did? He volunteered to carry that casket for a homeless dude's funeral. I was up front preaching at the funeral because I'm in the community. So they called me. Hey, pastor, a homeless guy needs a funeral. We want you to do it. Um, this is us working um, to feed some folk at a, um, an amen clinic we set up down here. And so they needed food. Um, we, we served the food at the amen clinic. This is our members working at the amen clinic. Hallelujah. Uh, this is us partnering with Southern Adventist University to clean up our church school. Um, this is us doing strategic planning so we can be ready for all of that stuff. Are you with me? Um, this is me and my wife. We went to a um, Southern, had a, a ministry fair. We went to Southern Adventist University to recruit some folk so they could come help us do our ministries. Are you with me? Uh, we had a community guest day. We invited the community in. These folk are from Partnership for Families and Children. We gave them an award and we started volunteering at their, at their building, helping battered women who, who, who sheltered at their um, facility. Are y'all with me? This is the work we do. Um, this is the community advisory board. Again, I talked about that already. Um, this is a this is last year during the pandemic. Um, we had a, a citywide day of prayer the, to pray the, the pandemic away, um, to call for unity because of all the social unrest. And so all these folks showed up in their cars and I, I got a chance to pray at this event. Are y'all with me? Um, and then anyway, that's it. Listen. I'm gonna just tell you just like this, man. Uh, let me let me let me get back because y'all probably looking at my email now. It's wide open. Isn't it? <laughs> Somebody said, "Hey, look, there's his email." Yes, that was my email. Listen, y'all. All I'm simply saying, Sister Merlene asked me to get on and share this message with you because it's a biblical message. It's grounded in Bible and spirit of prophecy. If you if you want to be a part of closing and finishing the work. It's hard for people to hear the gospel when hard. I tell my church, let me tell you what I tell my church. And I'm going to tell you this and then we're going to pray and I'm done. Two things. Um, when people have to bear an unceasing burden, are you with me? Their ability to worship God is impeded. Y'all get that? If they have a burden, consistent burden, and then they have to bear that burden over and over again, they can't worship God because the burden has them weighed down. And so, so what I tell my church members is we do ministry the way we do so we can turn the volume down in people's lives so they can hear the gospel clearly. Are y'all with me? Hunger is noise and it's loud. Um, the more hungry you are, the louder it gets. Racism is noise. The louder racism is, uh, uh, I mean, the more racism, the louder it is, the harder to hear the gospel. Um, poverty 
is is noise. Okay, sickness is noise. We do our health mess. Sickness is noise. When we can't hear the gospel, we can't respond. So we do ministry the way we do, so we can turn the volume down, and then we can proclaim the three angels' messages. Come on, somebody should say amen. So my simple my simple prayer to you, um, light bearers, is that you be light bearers. You have a powerful name for your congregation. The Bible says that we're to be salt and light. Let me tell you something about light. The light does not shine. Listen to what I'm saying. When you, when you open your refrigerator, are y'all listening to me? A light comes on. Are y'all listening? But you never look in the refrigerator and look at that light. Lights don't shine so people can look at the light. Lights shine so people can see what you're shining on. Are y'all listening? You don't want people to see you. You want people to see what you're shining on. Be light bearers. Shine. So people can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for giving me an opportunity to share with these wonderful folk um, the concept of repentance ethics. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that their hearts have been arrested by the Holy Spirit, that they're doing some um, some recalculating, some soul searching, some, some determinations on how they too can receive those blessings promised in Isaiah 58 by having the right kind of fast, the one described in verses six, seven, and eight. I thank you for how you're going to respond to their new postures. They're going to assume a, a posture of humility, Lord, a posture um, that, 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 that bears fruit worthy of repentance. And I just ask your blessings on them. Seal their commitments and save us. Save us all when you come. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. <laughs> now unto him who was able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne. Um, to the only wise God be honor, majesty, glory, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Lord bless you.